Welcome to our video uh, that's going to deal with messianic expectations or conceptions that existed in the time of Jesus. That's late Second Temple Judaism. Uh, we call it late Second Temple because the temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70 CE. And Jesus, of course, uh, begins his ministry somewhere around 30 CE. So uh, within about 40 years of when the temple is destroyed. Um, this first slide here, by the way, is uh, actually the shoreline at Capernaum. And uh, one of my favorite places on earth, but you can kind of imagine Jesus walking along the shoreline and calling a bunch of tired fishermen that had been working for hours uh, to come and follow him instead of fishing. And uh, must have been something compelling in his voice because they left and they followed him. This is the slide that you have in your uh, Judaism notes here already. Um, so uh, I'm going to have a bunch of no other slides here in, uh, on your website, the Canvas website. Uh, you will have another file that says Messianic Expectation that will have all of the slides that I'm getting ready to show you. But this one right here is the one that you already have in your Judaism outline. And um, as we talked about, Mashiach means anointed. Uh, and as a noun, of course, it means the anointed one. It is the same meaning as the Greek word Christ or Christos. They both mean anointed. So if you uh, are reading in your New Testament and you see the word Christ, you can just think in your mind, Messiah, Mashiach. It's the same word. And uh, in a lot of these uh, texts here, I have actually changed Christ to Messiah uh, just to be a little bit more consistent. Um, there are many messiahs in the history of uh, Judaism, of course. Kings, priests, prophets are all considered to be anointed by God, great warriors. Um, and we talked about uh, in uh, the last section uh, of the course, um, there's even one Messiah that isn't even a Jew, and that was great King Cyrus of Persia, who defeated Babylon and issued the decree that all the Jews could go back and rebuild their land. And we call that the Second Temple period, of course. Um, in the late Second Temple period, uh, the uh, majority of the people feel very oppressed uh, by Roman rule being a vassal kingdom of Rome. Uh, the more privileged, uh, the aristocrats, the high priests that are left in control, um, they have it really good. But the majority of the population is feeling pretty oppressed. And um, there is an idea of an ultimate Messiah or anointed one that's supposed to appear um, and lead a battle against all of uh, Judea's enemies, uh, after which they will be set back up uh, as a you know, self-ruling world kingdom again uh, with the glory they had back in the days of Solomon. And there's supposed to be an age of peace on earth. And so this is what the people are looking for. But this has to do with a Messiah that is going to come and is going to uh, defeat Rome and restore them again to sovereign rule. Messianic expectations we're going to talk about here. There are actually many of them. Um, and uh, actually, uh, did a research project over a semester years ago when I was working on a graduate degree at USF um, on the different kinds of messianic expectations in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I was studying the Dead Sea Scrolls at the time and comparing them with the messianic expectations that we see in the Tanakh, um, or uh, Christians call it the Old Testament, and uh, comparing that with the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the uh, uh, Hebrew uh, Tanakh or Old Testament. And um, so there are many different messianic conceptions, but there are three main ones in the time of Jesus, and one that has become very, very uh, important since the time of Jesus, which is the fourth one up here, the suffering servant. So these are the ones that we're really going to talk about. We're also going to talk about the idea of the messianic secret, uh, but we'll talk more about that when we get to it here. This is just kind of a uh, you know, condensed conclusion, but we're going to go through this step by step. The first messianic expectation is actually uh, the first one in time that is experienced. It goes all the way back to Moses um, and the period of the Torah. And Moses, speaking to the Israelites, um, makes it clear he's not the last one. Um, he's not the final prophet or the final lawgiver, but he actually says someone greater uh, than he is going to rise up in the future. He says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. So this is going to be the ultimate lawgiver. This is going to be the ultimate mediator, if you will. Now, when he says a prophet like me, let's think about this here. There's two aspects. First of all, nobody has seen miracles uh, performed 
by a human being before. There have been miracles, obviously Abraham's wife uh, having a healthy baby at 90 years old after being infertile her entire life could be considered a miracle. Um, but the idea of a human being possessing the power to do uh, the kinds of miracles that Moses did, um, they've never seen that before. So that would be one aspect. And the second aspect is Moses' authority as a mediator of God's covenant. Um, he is the one through whom God establishes his covenant, we call the Torah, um, the Mosaic covenant, the law of Moses. And um, so this is authority to mediate God's covenant. So this is what we're looking for here in a prophet like Moses. Now, I have to do our timeline thing, so I'm going to bounce back and forth through time and hopefully you won't get confused. If we bounce ahead a few centuries after Moses, when the Israelites have gotten into their land, after Solomon's son Rehoboam, who's an idiot, has divided the nation, and we have two nations, Israel in the north and Judah in the south, in the northern kingdom of Israel, there is a prophet that rises up by the name of Elijah, um, or if you want to say it correctly, it's Eliyah. But um, Elijah does some crazy miracles and, um, uh, you know, controlling the weather, for one thing, raising the dead. Um, and his uh, sidekick after him, Elisha, that receives uh, Elijah's anointing when Elijah is taken up to heaven in a chariot of fire, as it were. Um, he also uh, raises the dead and does some amazing miracles. So if it was just looking for the next anointing um, of uh, miracle working like Moses, one might think that uh, Elijah uh, and Elisha uh, would be the fulfilling of this. Um, but there's a problem with that. And that is, first of all, it's the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom isn't even really worshiping, uh, you know, at the temple in Jerusalem anymore. Um, but Elijah, he does not want to be any kind of an authority or a mediator of God's covenant. In fact, he's kind of antisocial. Uh, when God tells him to do something, he does it. He's obedient. Um, but when God doesn't have a plan for him, he would much rather hang out in his private cave with his disciples uh, that he's teaching. And um, really, again, wants nothing to do with being any kind of a mediator of God's covenant. So he doesn't really fit the bill in that regard. Um, the first person that comes along that does fit the bill in both regards would be Jesus, who does miracles uh, like nobody's business, miracles of physics, and actually uh, some that we've never seen before. But he also really believes that he has the authority to mediate God's covenant. And when we get to his teachings, a couple of videos from now, actually three videos from now, um, we'll see this, that he actually challenges um, contemporary interpretations of the Torah and says, no, you've got it wrong, this is it. And uh, as if he has the power in himself to interpret that. And um, nobody's really seen someone uh, presumed to speak with this kind of authority uh, before. And certainly no one has seen the kind of miracles that Jesus is doing, at least not since Elijah and then centuries before him. Uh, Moses. So um, this is the prophet like Moses, and some people in Jesus' time certainly did recognize, you know, here is a guy that's doing the miracles Moses did, and, and, and some that he didn't, and who is speaking with, like he has authority to interpret God's uh, covenant. So this is the first, and this is the oldest uh, messianic expectation uh, that's pretty well known. And again, when we get to uh, the uh, video on Jesus' teachings, I will remind you of this. Uh, next, and this one is really important here, I'll tell you why in a minute, is the uh, messianic expectation of the Davidic warrior king. Now, this is someone who is supposed to be a direct descendant from David, the king, uh, from the tribe of Judah, obviously, and, um, and from his son Solomon. And God, uh, speaking to King David through Nathan the prophet, tells him, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And this is in 2 Samuel 7. Um, all of the references you'll see are under the quotations here. Now, who is this offspring? A lot of people might have thought it was Solomon. I mean, when Solomon comes to the throne, these are the glory days of ancient Israel. They've never seen a king so powerful, so rich, so wise. Everybody wants to be Solomon's friend. Everybody's afraid of him. And uh, these are the glory days of ancient Israel. So some people might have thought, wow, this is, the, this is the promise. But of course, Solomon died. And not only did Solomon die, but after he died, uh, his idiot son Rehoboam splits the kingdom. 
And uh, so the kingdom is split, and once the uh, Jews go into exile, into the Babylonians, we have not seen a Davidic king reigning on the throne since then, not even to the current day. So we certainly do not have any fulfillment of this promise of a Davidic king, uh, you know, reigning, whose kingdom is going to reign forever. Uh, by the way, this does seem to imply some kind of uh, immortality given to this king, if in fact he's going to live forever. Um, but anyway, uh, since Solomon has died, uh, the major messianic expectation here is that someone is going to rise up who is going to be a descendant of David um, and someone who, uh, you know, could have had uh, some right to the throne if indeed there was still a Davidic uh, line of the monarchy going on, and that this person is going to be the warrior king who is going to reestablish um, Judea uh, as this world power. And um, so in the days of the Roman Empire, in Jesus' day, this is the main one that people are thinking about. Why? As I mentioned before, they're feeling very, very oppressed, and this is the king that is supposed to come with the power of God and reestablish the kingdom under their own rule uh, so that no longer they'll be oppressed by other nations around them. So if you happen to say the word Mashiach uh, in the time of Jesus, late Second Temple Judaism, the first thing that pops into anybody's mind when you say Messiah is the Davidic king. And again, the reason for that is because this is what a lot of the common people are looking for. Um, ironically, this is also the first thing that pops in the mind of the Romans or the high priests who are largely doing the Romans bidding. And uh, we talked about that in uh, one of the last Judaism videos that the Romans left the high priests in power to convince the people uh, using their power of religious legitimation that it's God's will that the people be good citizens of Rome. Uh, you know, pay your taxes on time and certainly don't start any rebellions. So when you hear someone claiming to be a Davidic Messiah, you're talking about someone who is saying, I'm the one that's going to lead the war against the Romans. So obviously the Romans and the high priests are very sensitive to this too. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, in just a few minutes here. So this is the one most people think of when you say the word Mashiach in the time of Jesus. Whether you love the idea or whether you hate the idea, it's still the first thing that pops in everybody's mind. Now, to remind you of something I said when we were talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls that were hidden uh, by the uh, inhabitants of Qumran out in the desert, the monastic community uh, that many people, including me, was started by the deposed Zadokite priests in the days of the Maccabees. Um, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we learned a lot about uh, the many different forms of Judaism in the Second Temple period. And uh, as I mentioned before, many of the things that I'm teaching you uh, in this section of the course, I could not have taught you uh, if we had not found the Dead Sea Scrolls, because a lot of this information uh, is new. So there are many different messianic expectations. Everybody does not agree on these things. And there's also an awful lot of syncretism of different messianic ideas. I mean, when you have like all these different messianic expectations, are they all the same guy? Which ones are the same guy? Which ones are a different guy? And by the way, there are people that believe that there's different messiahs that are coming. They're not all thought to be the same guy. But I want to give you some examples of syncretism just in, you know, in the common people in Jesus's day. And a great example here is a story of a blind guy named Bartimaeus. Jesus is coming out of Jericho and uh, he's getting a little bit famous at this time because he's been doing some crazy miracles. And um, so as he is coming out of the city, there is a blind beggar named Bartimaeus who's sitting by the roadside. And when he hears that it's Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he keeps on crying it out. And many rebuking, rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, saying, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. And throwing off his cloak, the blind man sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Now before I go on, let me just mention to you, nobody's ever opened the eyes of the blind before. I mean, Elijah didn't do it. Elisha didn't do it. Moses didn't do it. It's, you know, this is a brand new trademark miracle that Jesus has done. 
uh, a number of times. And we're going to talk more about his miracles uh, when we get to the miracle video, which is going to be two videos after this one, the second video after this one. The point of this, though, is remember when we are talking about the two messianic expectations we've looked at so far, which one of them is the one that's supposed to do miracles? I mean, which one is the one that anybody might think would have the power to open the eyes of the blind? Well, clearly that's the prophet like Moses, right? But what does the blind man call Jesus? He calls him son of David, son of David, which is you know, referring to her, him as if he is the Davidic Messiah. So in this uneducated blind man's mind, um, he believes that the uh, Davidic Messiah and the prophet like Moses are the same guy. So he's looking, because there's nowhere, by the way, in scriptures where it says that the uh, Davidic king is going to do miracles or, you know, open the eyes of the blind or anything, he's going to lead a battle and restore the nation, but he's not going around doing all kinds of miracles. That's the prophet like Moses. So he has clearly put together these two messianic expectations and thinks they're the same guy. Let's go to the third one now. The third one is the son of man. Now this is interesting. We're going in order, by the way. When we look at uh, Moses, uh, the prophet like Moses, this could be anywhere from you know 1250 to 1450 BCE, depending when you date the Exodus. When you look at the uh, Davidic king prophecy, Nathan prophesying to David there, uh, you're looking at the early to mid 10th century BCE. When you get to the Son of Man uh, messianic expectation here, this is happening during the Babylonian exile, and it's a vision revealed to a guy named Daniel. There's actually a book named after him in the Bible, so you might have heard of him. Um, and this is about 500 years after David, so um, we're moving closer to the time of Jesus. Now, Daniel sees a whole bunch of visions, as we mentioned uh, earlier, and a lot of these are seen to be apocalyptic visions or visions of the end days. And we know that because God told uh, Daniel uh, when he was asking about the interpretation of some of these things, uh, he was told, seal up the scroll for the time is not yet. And as we mentioned before, this means that these visions that Daniel sees the message is really not for the people of his day, uh, but this message is going to have great meaning for a generation that's going to come later. But for now, seal up the scroll. You know, it doesn't have a contemporary application. Um, so they're clearly apocalyptic visions. And this is one of them. Uh, he says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. Now, this is the key phrase right here. Just in the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days, that's a common term for, for God, the Almighty, and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting kingdom which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall never be destroyed. So here's a guy that looks like a son of man. He doesn't say is a son of man. There came one like a son of man. Now, son of man literally means human, mortal, you know, and uh, clearly this is not a mortal. I mean, he's, you know, in, in, in the heavenly realms. And um, so he, this is actually the most divine of the messianic expectations. Uh, however, the term son of man might be a little counterintuitive since it literally means mortal, but it's the name that's stuck and caught on. But again, Daniel said, I saw one that looked like he was a son of man. Um, and that apparently he marvels at this because of the, uh, the power that is given to this person that looks like a son of man. So son of man is what it is called. But again, although it means mortal, this is actually the most um, uh, divine uh, of the messianic expectations. Um, now, this same guy, the Son of Man is mentioned in all kinds of apocalyptic texts. There's a whole bunch of them. So this is a very popular character. Now, a lot of these apocalyptic texts don't actually make it into the canonical Hebrew Bible or the canonical New Testament. Um, but there are, uh, besides Daniel, there's another place that you see this guy. In the New Testament, the last book in Revelation, uh, you see this guy in Revelation uh, chapter 19, uh, coming with all of the armies of heaven. But there are many other apocalyptic books that also he's the guy coming, leading the armies of heaven, coming to earth to eradicate evil out of the earth and set up God's kingdom. Um, so this is a very interesting one. Now, a lot of people, 
you can probably already figure this out, they've already syncretized this with the idea of the Davidic king. And so while they're thinking of the Davidic king that is coming to, uh, of course, defeat the Romans and set them back up as a world power on earth, they're also thinking uh, that this would be this uh, eschatological, you know, glorious paradisal kingdom as well. And they're thinking of the Son of Man and the Davidic king is the same person. And I'll give you an example of that in one of the apocalyptic books, which is called Fourth Ezra, um, or uh, Second Esdras, depending uh, which uh, version you get. The heavenly son of man warrior king introduced in Daniel, again, is also featured in a number of apocalyptic texts. Now, the example from Fourth Ezra, first of all, in uh, 1232, he says, this is the Messiah whom the Most High has kept until the end of days, so we're talking about the eschaton, who will arise from the offspring of David, so we're talking about the Davidic Messiah, um, but clearly, you know, this is the Son of Man in this context. He said to me, just as no one can explore or know what is in the depths of the sea, so no one on earth can see my Son or those who are with him except in the time of his day. So his Son is not going to be revealed until the time that it's necessary. So what we've got here is we've got someone who is clearly uh, in the, the Son of Man uh, vein here, but he's also called a, a, the offspring of David, and he's also called my son, so he's the son of God. So here you have the syncretism of the Davidic king, the son of man, and the idea of, you know, someone completely deified, a son of God here. Um, interesting. There you go. He wins the Messiah, the offspring of David, and my son. So these three are all put together here. Next, we come to the fourth one that is in our list. It's called the suffering servant. Now, as you're going to see, nobody, while Jesus is alive, is expecting this at all. And we'll explain this a little bit uh, more in just a minute. But first, let's take a look at this, okay? This is from Isaiah 53. And this is the quintessential suffering servant text, although there are others as well. Who has believed? What is heard from us and to whom has the arm of the lord been revealed for he and this is talking about the suffering servant grew up before god like a young plant like a root out of dry ground he had no form or majesty that we should look at him no beauty that we should desire him he was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and as one from whom men hide their faces he was despised and we esteemed him not Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him, he has put into grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Wow. So, first of all, he has no beauty, no majesty that we should desire. In the end of the chapter right before this, which is the same continuation, it says that his appearance was marred more than any man. And um, if you uh, have ever seen The Passion of the Christ or any of the other movies that depict this, um, after being whipped 39 times, save one, um, and just beat to a pulp, you're looking pretty rough. Uh, Jesus is not pretty at this point. And um, so he's clearly rejected by men. He's being crucified. But what it's saying here is that he's bearing our griefs and carrying our sorrows, and with his wounds, we're healed. 
uh, like sheep we've gone astray, somehow this is bringing us back to God. The next uh, section here is he doesn't defend himself. Uh, he willingly uh, submits to this uh, destiny that he is supposed to be sacrificed. Uh, like a lamb led to the slaughter, he keeps his mouth shut, doesn't defend himself at all. So he's cut off out of the land of the living. It says stricken for the transgression of the people. It says he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. Now, if you uh, know the crucifixion story of Jesus, actually after he is taken down off the cross, there is a rich man named Joseph of Arimathea, a Pharisee, uh, who believes in Jesus, who actually gives his tomb for Jesus to be buried in. So he is actually the rich man in the story. Um, had done no violence, there was no deceit in his mouth. So this is someone that's not guilty of anything. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him. And he makes his soul an offering for guilt. And it says, my servant will make many to be accounted righteous and he shall bear their iniquities. So he is a sacrifice for sin, for guilt. He's making many people righteous by actually taking their sins on himself. And it says here, uh, he was numbered with the transgressors. He certainly was esteemed a criminal uh, and, and uh, crucified as a criminal. And we'll tell you the story of that in the next uh, video here. It says, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. So he is actually the sacrifice for sin that, of course, Christians believe, uh, you know, takes care of all of our unworthiness and makes it possible for us to come back and have fellowship with God again. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Nobody in the time of Jesus has ever thought that this guy is the same guy as the Davidic king, the son of, you know, man, or the prophet like Moses. No, it's never crossed anybody's mind at all. And that's something that a lot of Christians don't know. So let's explain how we know this and let's explain why it's true. We're not saying that nobody knows about this guy. Everybody knows about this guy. Well, anybody that knows anything about the scriptures at all, this guy's famous. And there's a lot of uh, you know debate about who in fact this guy is. Some people think he's just kind of like a metaphorical representation for the entire nation of Israel. And a lot of Jews still think that today. So a lot of people know who this is and uh, they have different ideas about you know what it might represent. So my point is not that it's unknown. My point is that nobody thinks that this guy is the same guy as you know the prophet like Moses, the Davidic warrior king Messiah, or the Danielic son of man. And there are some really uh, good reasons why. First of all, let's just be logical here. Um, it's very illogical to think that the winner and the loser of a conflict or a contest are the same person. If you're talking about a fight and you say, who won the fight? And you say, so-and-so, uh, who lost the fight? And you tell me the same name, I'm gonna go, wait, wait, wait. You can't win the fight and lose the fight. Was the guy successful? Yes, he's sitting on the throne. Uh, you know, was the guy successful? No, he's killed. Well, that can't be the same guy, can it? So this is absolutely logical. There's no reason anybody would think these are the same guy. The three major messiahs all have one thing in common. They win. But this suffering servant, he doesn't even fight. He doesn't defend himself. Um, he willingly surrenders and gives his life as a sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. He's not conquering uh, you know, evil. He's not winning any battles. He's not sitting on a throne. He's like a lamb led to the slaughter. So logically speaking, and by the way, if you're a Christian, you got to really do some bracketing here, okay? This is logical. Who in the world would ever think that this guy was the same as the conquering Messiah? Nobody. If you're a Christian, the only reason that you think it is because you've been taught it your entire life. And those things that are most familiar to you make a lot of sense. So let's talk about uh, you know, how do we know for sure, first off, that this syncretism was never considered before Jesus' death and resurrection? Beyond the logical aspect, how do we know for sure? First of all, we find no precedent, precedent for this belief in any of the uh, contemporaneous writings in terms of the uh, scriptures or even the apocryphal uh, books from Jesus' time. We just do not see this suffering servant uh, you know, paying the price for sin and then somehow rising from the dead and being the Davidic king. We don't see this. It doesn't exist in any of the writings. This doesn't start till after Jesus' life. So this is brand new. Secondly, let's look at Jesus' own disciples. Jesus' own disciples are expecting a Messiah that's a Davidic king, that's a conquering king. And Jesus tells them numerous times 
he's going to be killed and buried and rise from the dead. Now, they never grasp it. And if you look through the Gospels and look at the different times that Jesus told them, every time it says that they're profoundly confused, and sometimes it says they're afraid to ask him any more about it. Their consternation is great. They're perplexed. What the heck does this mean? This is nothing they've ever considered. They're thinking that Jesus is going to, you know, be revealed and he's going to take the throne and he's going to reestablish the kingdom. And this bothers them so much that there is actually one story we're going to look at in just a couple of minutes where one of his key disciples, Simon Peter, you might have heard of him, actually gets so upset by this teaching at one point that he takes Jesus aside and rebukes Jesus. That means strongly corrects Jesus and tells Jesus that he is wrong about his destiny, about his mission. Now, that seems pretty darn arrogant, doesn't it? But understand this, how much must this teaching that Jesus is going to be killed, how much must it have bothered Peter for him to be so arrogant as to challenge Jesus's understanding of his own mission? It doesn't make much sense, but you can see how much it bothered Peter, and you can see how foreign it was to all the disciples because they just did not get it. Going on, if there were any teaching anywhere in existence that the suffering servant was also the Davidic Messiah or the Son of Man, I mean, even if it was some outlying group that people considered, you know, cultish or crazy, if the disciples had known of any group anywhere that thought that the suffering servant was the Davidic king, would they have not considered that? Well, of course, they're perplexed. They're racking their brains trying to figure out what the heck Jesus is talking about. But they've got nothing, absolutely nothing. They've got nothing to make sense of this, which again is more proof that nobody's ever thought of this before. Nobody's ever imagined such a thing. It just doesn't compute. Instead, we see Jesus's disciples arguing about who's going to sit on Jesus's right hand and who's going to sit on his left hand when he, you know, is sitting on his throne ruling over the kingdom. And they're not talking about some, you know, mystical future or heavenly kingdom. They're talking about here when he restores the kingdom in their world. That's what they're looking for. And they're even talking about who's going to be greatest in the kingdom, who's going to have the most power when he becomes king. So again, all of these things that Jesus has said, they're just not sinking in. And the final proof they haven't sunk in it might be a little hard to understand, but if you think about human nature and cognitive dissonance, it'll make a lot of sense. After Jesus is crucified, the disciples are dismayed. None of them is expecting him to rise from the dead. Now, he's told them numerous times he's going to die and rise from the dead, and yet none of them are expecting it, because this is just so unthinkable that the teaching has just not sunk in. Ever hear a whole bunch of information that makes no sense to you? It's just confusing. Do you remember it? Well, probably not. You know, there has to be some logic to it. It has to connect with something that you understand for you to be able to store it in memory. So they're not expecting the resurrection, and they're shocked when he actually comes back alive, even though he's told them that he's going to. Now, so it isn't until after Jesus' resurrection that his disciples finally understand. Now, this is the beginning. I say it again. This is the beginning of the brand new theology that the suffering servant is the same person as the Davidic king, as the son of man, and as the prophet like Moses. Nobody has ever thought this before. So it is Jesus's followers after his resurrection for the first time that put this together. And this is where the whole suffering servant idea comes from. All right, so let's talk um, about the messianic secret. This is a very interesting concept and uh, it's uh, something that is uh, talked about a lot and debated uh, a lot in New Testament scholarship. Now, what I have here on this page, uh, just so that you can see it, is the entire text I'm going to be going from, but rather than read the whole thing, I'm just gonna have another slide here where you'll see I'm gonna have the key verses we're gonna talk about here, okay? So, as they're coming back from Caesarea Philippi at one point, Jesus uh, asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? Who do people say the Son of Man is? Make a mental note, he's calling himself Son of Man here. Who do they say that I am? Apparently, 
uh, there's some confusion. Jesus isn't answering all their questions. He's just doing miracles and teaching them all kinds of uh, virtue ethics and all kinds of neat things, but he's not really claiming to be any particular thing. So the disciples say, well, some say that you're John the Baptist. By the way, John the Baptist has recently been beheaded by Herod Antipas. So some people think that it's John the Baptist raised from the dead. Some say it's Elijah. Um, and uh, there is a scripture actually about Elijah coming back before the great day of the Lord. Um, some think Jeremiah, some think one of the prophets. There's all kinds of people thinking all kinds of things here. And so then Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? And at this point, Simon Peter uh, says, you're the Messiah the son of the living God. And in your New Testament, it'll probably say Christ here. But again, the Greek Christ means exactly the same thing as the Hebrew Messiah. You're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. That means son of Jonah, his father's name. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. So apparently he has not explicitly told his disciples uh, this at this point in time. And uh, so when Simon says he's the Messiah, Jesus says, Great, you got it. But Simon doesn't have it as much as he thinks he does because he's got a real un misunderstanding about what being the Messiah is, as we said before. And so Jesus at this point shows his disciples that, you know, this is what's going to happen here. This is the kind of Messiah I am. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and they're going to kill me. And on the third day, I'm going to rise from the dead. So this is his explanation of what it means to be Messiah. Now, they don't really get this. This is why he has told them to tell no one that he was Messiah. It says he strictly charges his disciples to tell no one he is Messiah. Why? Very clearly, that is what everybody thinks as soon as this idea Messiah gets put into their head. So, when he tells his disciples that he is going to go to Jerusalem and he's going to die. And well, this is the place where Peter takes him aside and says, and maybe, by the way, Peter's feeling a little confident because he just came up with the right answer to the question. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. And so he's thinking, well, apparently I, you know, God showed me some stuff. So he actually thinks that maybe, you know, Jesus, the Messiah, has some major mistakes about who he is and what he came for. And Simon Peter graciously is going to correct Jesus so he doesn't make a mistake. How silly is this? So Peter takes him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And Jesus rebukes him. Jesus knows exactly what he's come to do. And he tells his disciples, If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And this, of course, is uh, an allusion to how he's actually going to be died, how he's actually going to die, be killed, crucifixion. For whoever will save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So this is not going to end in a glorious kingdom. This is going to end in a shameful death. Now, he goes on and he says, he's talking about the future now, for the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. This is amazing. He's basically saying that he is going to suffer, just like the suffering servant we saw, only the disciples are not putting this together at all. This is brand new to them, and it doesn't make any sense. And then he says that he's the son of man that's going to come back with the armies of heaven and the angels of God to set up God's kingdom. But first he's going to die. And again, if you've ever read the Gospels, you see the disciples do not get this. They're just confused and perplexed, and they don't really understand what he's talking about. What's the most desired messianic expectation among the majority of the common people? We've said the Davidic warrior king. <laughs> What's the first thing these people think of when they hear the word Mashiach? The Davidic warrior king. <laughs> what does the Davidic Messiah do? He conquers the Jews' enemies and restores their glorious kingdom. So who is the Jews' enemy? Rome. The Romans. So when you say Mashiach, you're talking about someone who is going to start a war against the Romans and conquer them. Now, let's look at it from the point of view of the Romans and the Jewish high priests. What's the most troubling messianic expectation for the Romans and the Jewish high priests? The Davidic warrior king. Why? Because the Davidic warrior king is supposed to start a war with Rome. And the Romans do not want a rebellion. And the high priests don't want a rebellion either, because remember, they've been left in power by the Romans to keep the peace. 
And if a rebellion breaks out, a bunch of people following some Davidic Messiah, uh, then the high priests haven't done their job, and the Romans are going to come and depose them, which, of course, we know happens in 70 CE. Now, is Jesus intending to start a war with Rome? No. His entire ministry, never does he speak against Caesar or against the Roman Empire. And believe me, people are listening. Because if he ever said anything against Rome or Caesar, they would have arrested him immediately, just like they do with every other Davidic Messiah. There's a bunch of them. Jesus is not the only one. We know of a couple of them by name through history. If they get two or three hundred men following them, at that point they're a problem, and the Romans will send out a legion of soldiers and annihilate them. But they leave Jesus alone for three years which is about the length of his ministry, as we'll see. We know this from the Gospel of John. And believe me, everybody's listening. The Romans are listening. The high priests are listening. The Herodians are listening. The Pharisees are listening. They're all listening to see if he is going to say anything about the fact that he's the Davidic Messiah coming to overthrow Rome. Never mentions it. Instead, what does Jesus say he's come to do? You, you know already, to suffer and die and rise from the dead, which his disciples just do not get. Now, if the disciples call him Messiah, what's going to happen? The people are going to get the wrong idea. And the Romans are going to get the wrong idea, too. They're going to see him as a threat. So why does Jesus say, don't call me Messiah? Well, it's not because he's not the Messiah. He just told Simon Peter, you're right, I am. But he says, don't call me that. And the reason is because the word is pregnant with meaning. And it's a meaning that does not in any way correlate with what Jesus has come to do. He has not come to start a war against the Romans, so don't call him that term that immediately makes people think that that's who he is and what he's come for. So um, again, this is called the messianic secret. He orders his disciples not to call him Mashiach. What does he call himself? Well, as you might have noticed in that scripture we just looked at, he tends to refer to himself as son of man. What's the advantage of Jesus speaking of himself as a son of man? There's, there's a double ambiguity here. First off, son of man, as we said, literally means human or mortal. Who would think Jesus is so blasphemous as to be claiming to be the son of man that Daniel saw? Nobody. Secondly, Jesus often speaks of himself as son of man in the third person. In other words, he doesn't, he doesn't usually say, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. He'll say the son of man is going to go and he's going to be betrayed by the chief priests. And an example of this ambiguity working from the Gospel of John in chapter 12 uh, he's speaking to a crowd, and the crowd answers him saying, We have heard from the law that the Messiah remains forever. So how can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? This means crucified. Who is this Son of Man? So again, the ambiguity is working. They do not understand uh, that Messiah and Son of Man, as he's talking about it, are the same. This is, this is ambiguous. It makes people listen to what he's teaching instead of trying to kind of pigeonhole him in some category in terms of what Messiah they think he is. But what does Jesus really mean when he says, Son of Man? Well, we don't find out till his ministry is over. Well, actually, we did find out in the scripture before where he says the Son of Man is going to come with the angels of God, he tells his disciples. But this is not something he's declaring openly until he's finally arrested uh, by the high priests uh, the day before he is crucified or the night before he is crucified. And here's the story. The high priest stood up in the midst of the assembly and asked Jesus, you know, have you no defense? Have you no answer to make? What is it that these people testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. And again, the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed? And at this point, Jesus speaks and he says, I am. And you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. In other words, I'm the guy that Daniel saw. And at this point, the high priest tears his garments and says, what further witnesses do we need? You've heard his blasphemy. What's your decision? And all of the high priest cronies say he's worthy of death. And we're going to talk more about this story in the next video here. So he clearly is saying that he is the son of man that is going to come back from heaven uh, with the armies of heaven. Um, but not this time. This time he's the suffering servant who is willingly going to be a sacrifice for sin. Now, finally, let's look back at this same slide that we started with. That is in your uh, Judaism outline. And let's look at these four major messianic conceptions. When Jesus came, did he fulfill the expectation of the Messiah that's a prophet like Moses? Yes, absolutely. He did miracles 
uh, a plenty that people had not seen before and uh, got very famous for doing them. And as far as the uh, feeling that he had the authority to mediate God's covenant, people had never seen someone speaking with this kind of authority. Even the most prominent rabbis are citing like other rabbis and so on. Jesus rarely cites anyone. Uh, and we're going to talk about this when we get to his teachings. How about the Davidic Messiah? I don't think Jesus is on a throne uh, in Jerusalem uh, ruling the world. So apparently, no. The Davidic Messiah, this has not been fulfilled. How about the Son of Man? Anybody seen Jesus coming back with the armies of heaven in the clouds? I think that would have made it on the news. Um, and certainly, uh, he hasn't set up God's kingdom on earth after eradicating all evil. So no, the Son of Man has not been fulfilled either. How about the suffering servant? Well, clearly, yes, that was fulfilled. We see that. So Jesus came the first time to fulfill the prophet like Moses and the suffering servant. And what Christians believe is that he is going to come back a second time. And when he comes back the second time, he is going to come back as the Davidic Messiah, the Son of Man, the Son of God with the armies of heaven, to set up his kingdom on earth. So this is what we're looking for in the second coming. Now, the term for this is parousia, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A. -S but it means the second coming uh, of Jesus when he is going to come back and fulfill the prophecies, the messianic expectations of the Davidic Messiah and the Son of Man. That's all we have here for this one. We're going to go on and we're going to have a video after this on the different sects in Second Temple Judaism. And we'll learn a lot more about Jesus because we'll see how they respond to him and what kind of uh, relations he has with the different sects. And we're going to learn a lot more about how he is actually arrested and put to death and why. See you then.